And uh, yes, there was a deal between incumbent radio stations and the policymakers to in fact limit competition, to call it public interest, and then to have some nominal uh, uh, public interest obligations on the broadcasters that basically never get fulfilled. But the political clout that was obtained by putting regulators in the, in the policy loop was very valuable to people like Herbert Hoover and Senator Dill and the other regulators at the time. It was also very valuable to radio stations that knew that the rents of incumbency would be improved by limits on competitive entry. They got what they wanted. The regulators got what they wanted. And now it's time for the First Amendment to give the rest of us what we want. I'll be affording some response time to the panel in just a moment. I'm going to steal a little response time myself first, Tom. Uh, as far as conservatives being on the wrong side of the fairness doctrine, my recollection is that my old uh, stable head and uh, political former broadcaster Jesse Helms was always an opponent of the fairness rule. Uh, Who? Jesse Helms. Helms. I think he, he was opposed? considered a conservative. Incorrect. Very, very much a champion of the Fairness Doctrine. It's not my recollection. Well, uh, it, it's the fact. Um, if you read the Federalist, if you read the Federalist Society publication, Robert Corn Revere has a wonderful uh, piece in the, the uh, February '09. So you may be right. Well, uh, it's I'm my sorry, recollection from many conversations from Jesse when he was a TV station owner that he was opposed to it then when he was doing the editorials and was being attacked for the editorials and it was well, being find that, But I, I do know that Robert Corn Revere mm -hmm. cites Jesse Helms as a longtime champion, uh, along with I Helms. doubt if he knew him as well as I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say there, no, were, there were a lot of conservatives who viewed it as a way to get around liberal media bias and the traditional media outlets. They, they, they thought they could get equal time on the radio. And so there were some conservatives, I can't speak to Senator Helms, but there were some conservatives who were. I'm certainly willing to uh, let that one lay. <laughs> any event, I think I'm going to give Jamie the first and last rebuttal since he is outnumbered at least in direction. So Jamie, if you want to take it away. Thank you, Your Honor. Then well, we'll come back to Seton and then finally to Tom. I mean, but I suppose that, that I don't view much distance between my position and Tom's position. Maybe he doesn't agree with that, but I, you know, I consider myself a very strong champion of free speech and libertarianism. Um, I did not hear him um, challenge the notion that if uh, we have a publicly regulated public resource that there has to be an opportunity for the public to speak through it. I think that was the notion behind the Fairness Doctrine. I think we agree it's been uh, outstripped by events. It doesn't necessarily work so well. I mean, I'm not quite sure how convincing that correlation was. The, the causation wasn't completely clear to me, but I definitely saw you know, some kind of correlation post deregulation. But in any event, um, you know, my question, I guess, is are, are, you, are you arguing for the abolition of the FCC and a complete deregulation of the broadcast spectrum such that there should be no regulation at all and then we have, you know, a total free market and whatever happens, happens? I mean, that strikes me as the best argument for not having, a, for not having any regulation at all. But if we're going to deal with the system we've got, you know, I think there are a whole sequence of new generation issues that we've got to deal with, including, you know, incredible concentration of the media and conglomeration of uh, media resources. I think that's the greatest threat, really, to the diversity of freedom of speech and expression in the country today. Seaton? Well, I've, I've always said the public interest is best served by what the public is interested in. And you don't have to chase around a mythical notion of diversity, you just have to flip the microphone on and if people want to listen, they'll listen and they'll sell advertising and they'll remain on the air. And if they don't want to listen, they'll change the channel. And we've had multiple attempts to deliver liberal talk radio to the uh, masses, both as individuals from Jim Hightower to Mario Cuomo uh, and then Air America, which is file for bankruptcy so many times, I think it's going to file for nonprofit status at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and people don't want it. So I think the people's voices are being delivered to the masses because they're choosing A and not B. So, Tom, but, we're going back uh, to you, Jamie, after sure. we hear from Tom. Yeah, I, I suppose I was asking if I was in favor of uh, uh, abolishing the Federal Communications Commission? Well, you know, I mean, I dream like everybody else. 
<laughs> but, but you know, but it's it, it's it really is a straw man to say it's it's it's, it's either abolition. <laughs> it's either, what's the over under on abolition of the FCC? <laughs> um, it's either abolition or nothing. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I'll be happy to give you my recent uh, article, the Journal of Economic Perspectives: uh, Optimal Abolition of FCC Spectrum Allocation. Exactly how to abolish the FCC in a spectrum allocation role. And the, the fact is you don't have to dump the agency to leave what's a, a adjudicative and proper in terms of uh, regulating uh, the resource in a proper way uh, and, and allowing a market uh, with, with consumer choice uh, to rule what people get. And let me just point out, when you, when you say that there's no, uh, there, there's no, you know, there's, how can you have an, a, an opposition to, to the reasonable idea that people get a chance to reply and be equal and fun and, 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 and uh, both sides? Well, the, you know, let me just pick a random case, the Red Lion case. I mean, that, that was actually an exercise in censorship by a monitoring campaign set up by a political group sponsored by the Democratic National Committee to, by the uh, testimony of one of the members of that group, to harass and intimidate the uh, right-wing broadcasters who were uh, giving uh, the Kennedy-Johnson administration trouble originally with the nuclear test ban treaty and had a different point of view. And they filed a fairness doctrine complaint after fairness doctrine complaint, knowing that they were small cash-only stations, and if they had to put up with this kind of harassment, that they would be less likely uh, to voice these opinions. Now that case got, that, that's, a, by the way, it's a wonderful book by Fred Friendly, another former uh, CBS uh, president, Fred Friendly, the late uh, uh, journalist and, um, uh, and professor, uh, the good guys, the bad guys, and the First Amendment. And uh, the fact is that case got to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court looked for a chilling effect. It was sitting on a chilling effect. And they upheld, yes, enthusiastically upheld a sanction on a tiny little radio station in Red Lion, Pennsylvania that had charged $7.50 for a 15-minute slot that attacked a left-wing journalist. And when the journalist, through this monitoring committee, he never heard the broadcast, said, oh, I want to reply, they sent him a card, said, look, pay $7.50, you can have 15 minutes just like the other guy. He said, no, I want free equal time. The whole point of that campaign was to get a tax on speech, to make sure that the, the people who broadcast views that were not of their own uh, were going to pay extra uh, for actually reaching the airwaves. It so wasn't the original was, broadcast actually a book review. It wasn't even a... Well, it was, it was, on, it was a book... Uh, uh, it was under the guise of a book review, at least. He wrote the book he on... Separaneous after a bit. He wrote the book on Goldwater, Extremists on the Run. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he attacked Fred Cook for two minutes. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it a book review. <laughs> he attacked Fred Cook, said he was a scurrilous left-wing journalist. And That's a had, book review. <laughs> <laughs> and he had, well, he said he'd been fired, he had been fired on an ethics, uh, you know, problem with the, from the New York Times. Now, I know this is a conservative group, so being fired by the New York Times is no, no criticism at all. But, um, uh, yeah, he was attacking Fred Cook, and that, it was a right of reply to, an, uh, to a personal attack. Yeah, well, they, I happened. think he said that he worked for a communist entity. He'd been fired for making false charges. Well, he went to work a, for the nation, and I don't think he called it communist, but he, he said it was he a did. left wing magazine. Okay. He, you he, go he ahead said, and plunge into your rebuttal now, Jamie. Well, I mean, I mean, it's a good example, but let's start with this. There, did, what do you think was the economic value to the radio station of the broadcast license that it had? I mean, you're an expert on it. I mean, was. Was there an economic value to the license that the radio station had? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, in other words, the, the, I mean, remember, in those days, the idea was, you know, we're not dealing with an age where there was an internet and where there were multiple avenues for public communication and discourse. So, a radio station was a big deal. So, we hand off this valuable commodity to a private entity and say, we're going to condition it on your public interest obligations. They put a guy up there who calls another guy essentially a communist, saying he works for communist organizations. He got fired. He defended Aldra Hiss. Um, he's you know now written a book to smear Barry Goldwater and so on, and goes on. And uh, this guy says, I want a chance to respond. And that's precisely what the political attack rule was about, to give people the right to respond. Now